Good evening, everyone. My name is Melissa Shackleton Dan, and I'm the chair of the board of Fauna and Flora International, the U.S. board. And it is wonderful to see so many of you here this evening. I think, though, most of us are really here to see Sir David Attenborough, and it is a real joy to be able to share an evening with him and hear some of his reflections about the conservation world that he has so influenced. Um, I'm going to turn the podium over to Katie Frohart, uh, who's the executive director of the U.S. operation, um, with great pleasure, and she will uh, provide some more introductions. So, with Katie. Thank you so much, and thanks to each and every one of you for joining us tonight for such a special celebration of international conservation with Sir David Attenborough. I first learned of the work of Fauna and Flora International more than 10 years ago when I was based in Rwanda running a mountain gorilla program, one of our longest running programs. This is a program that Sir David actually started many years ago, motivating our earliest efforts to protect the mountain gorillas and creating the program that I later directed in Rwanda post the 1994 genocide. In Rwanda, I learned firsthand of FFI's very collaborative approach to conservation working in partnership with local and national organizations and embracing the tough but right challenge of building local capacity so that conservation efforts are locally driven and locally held. Listing Sir David's accomplishments would have me up here for far too long. Last year, he was voted the most trusted celebrity in Britain and in the top 10 <laughs> heroes of our time. I had to, I had to. <laughs> His Life television series, which is made up of more than 74 programs, is still in production. And Life in Cold Blood, Reptiles and Amphibians, is due to air in 2008. The pioneer of nature documentaries, David has attracted more than 500 million viewers worldwide, bringing us all his powerful images of wildlife and people, and inspiring us with opportunities and the challenges that protecting our fragile planet presents. Conservation literacy blossomed as Sir David broadcast from those special places in far corners of the earth. Sir David's strong leadership of FFI as vice president has been instrumental in guiding so many of our programs. So it is my great honor to introduce him to you tonight so that he may share his thoughts on are we changing life on Earth? Please join me in welcoming to Washington, D.C., Sir David Attenborough. Fifty years ago, the world was a very, very different place. I was uh, a young television producer, and I decided that I wanted to start making natural history films. Um, and I went to the London Zoo. And uh, since I didn't know anything about Africa, Asia, or anything else except Britain, I thought there would be somebody there who might help me to find my way through the natural world. And indeed there was uh, a marvelous man who was a curator of reptiles called Jack Lester. And together we cooked up an idea which would be absolute anathema today. We decided that we would go with the London Zoo to catch animals in the wild and bring them back to the London Zoo. And now, these days, you wouldn't dream of doing that. Responsible zoos breed their animals. Responsible news know perfectly well uh, that the stock of animals in the wild is limited. It is not infinite. We went to Madagascar. I tried to find out about Madagascar from the French, and there was no film, no natural history film at all, at all made in Madagascar. And those wonderful ranges of lemurs, which you will have seen, and which tourists go and visit today, they were, had never been seen on television. And in, I have had all my life a passion for, for birds of paradise. And uh, nobody 50 years ago had filmed wild birds of paradise displaying in the wild. One of the great mind-blowing experiences and scenes of the natural world. And it took us three months before we managed it. 
and we walked into valleys where no Europeans had been before. Uh, and it was a, an extraordinary and unforgettable time. How things have changed today. A mere 50 years. And why? There is one huge change that has taken place in those 50 years. And that is that there are more than twice as many human beings on this planet today as there were then. There were just something over two billion in 1954. Now there are more than six and a half billion. And the consequences of those, of course, uh, of that change has been enormous. This huge expansion in human beings has also demonstrated a very extraordinary fact of Homo sapiens, which is that they, Homo sapiens loves to aggregate. It loves to live together. And thank goodness, because if it didn't, if it didn't, there would be no wilderness. If we all demanded five hectares or whatever it is, we wouldn't be able to exist. But the consequences of that is that the majority of the population of this planet, something like 80% are urbanized, and 80% are getting further and further away from the natural world. Another consequence of this huge expansion of, of our numbers, of human numbers, has been climate change, which you've all heard about. And that brings more problems. We have a responsibility to make sure that people know about the natural world, and Paradoxically, they do. They, people know more about the animals of this planet today than they have ever done before, even though they are less in touch with it. But unless they are in touch with it, they won't care, um, and they won't do what is necessary in their own lives and with their own governments and with their own money to conserve that which lies beyond the city limit. My feeling is that the Fauna and Flora International has become one of the key societies in the world. It was, in its time, a pioneer. It was, in fact, the first international conservation body. Its role, its importance, its value has grown and grown and grown over the 50 years that I've known it and the hundred years that it has existed. And it has never been greater than it is today. So all of you who are joining this great movement to protect the natural world in whatever way we can, thank you very much. Your work could have never been more important. Thank you. Well, in, in wrapping up, I would just like to say thank you to everybody here tonight, not, not just for coming, but I noticed that we've got in the room tonight not only sponsors, donors, but partners and collaborators from a broad range of constituencies here, and all of whom have um, an input into the work that we do. So thank you all for that. But I'd also like to thank Sir David himself for coming. I think we all recognise um, what he does as his day job, which is to uh, work tirelessly at producing the best quality uh, television and film presentations, um, most of which he produces and presents all himself with a dedicated team. But also, he's been moonlighting all these years as well. He's had another job, and that's to help organizations such as Fauna and Flora Preservation Society, FFI as it is today, um, move ahead, get ahead, influence, gain ground. And he's done that for us over the last 50 years since he's been involved with us. So I'd just like to say a big thank you to Sir David for that. He doesn't have to do it. He does it in the interest of conservation and conservation of our planet. So thank you, Sir David. <laughs> a living life.